Hi there, so this is a uh, segment about finding principal stresses in three dimensions and then we'll go on to consider a general rotation um, of axes and then we'll think a little bit about uh, tensor rotations, uh, how they work um, and uh, carry on um, thinking about uh, generally how many angles we've got free and what the invariants are and so on. So we start off with a, a generalization of the idea of an inclined plane. We've taken a a little unit cube, and we've put through it an imaginary cut, KJL, and then we have to put a stress on that cut plane, sigma, in order to retain equilibrium. Um, so there's the force from the top half of the cube that was stopping the bottom half of the cube from flying away. Um, and on the surface of the original cube, we have these stresses. Um, that is, we have nine of them, sigma, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3, and the shears 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2, 3, and 3, 2. Of course, that's a, it was a symmetric stress tensor, so there's only six independent ones. And the cut plane uh, will have a, a normal x hat, which is a unit, so hat is denoting it being a unit vector, which we'll do just for convenience. Um, and it's got uh, components L, M, and N. And if you take the dot product of those with the basis vectors for the 1, 2, and 3 axes, then you get L, M, and N. And so these are the direction cosines. That is, uh, these are each cos of the angle between x hat and uh, each of the uh, vectors. Um, so this then is a unit vector as well. Sums of three cos is necessarily 1. Um, so, and we say that this uh, cut plane K J, uh, JKL has an area A. So then uh, we can say that uh, this area back here, KOL, has an area of A times L because it's the projection of A onto uh, the uh, one onto this plane here, which has its normal along the uh, uh, one axis. If I didn't need to check that, I've drawn my J. KL, um, and then I've got K. O, that's K O J. Thank you. Uh, and therefore, this is the projection of with M because it's the second index, which is has its normal there. So K O J has its normal in the second axis. So you need to take the M component to find the projection of A onto uh, that axis. Um, and therefore that area KOJ is AM. So this is just a uh, vector projections, which he did in first year. Um, so then we can say that uh, this plane here, uh, this purple guy, the back side, well, that's got its normal in the one direction um, there. So uh, that's KOL is equal to A times the projection into the one direction, which is L. Um, and then the third one would be green. Um, and that's this guy down here. It's the whole of the triangle, of course, but I can't color it all in. So that's J-O-L. And that has a, an area of A projected down on the three axis. So that's A-N. Great. So, um, da, 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 da. So those are our areas. Now, if we want to uh, find the values of that sigma must be, well, we've got to resolve in the x, y, and z, so the 1, 2, and 3 directions. OK? So uh, if we say in the first direction, we can say, well, uh, all the forces on the right and left must balance. So we've got a sigma here on the cut plane itself. Uh, that's acting on an area A, giving me a force, but I need to resolve that force into the one direction, wherever the one direction is. So that way, it, it's coming out, out of the board this way. I need to resolve it into the one direction, which is that way. Check, I've got a genuinely right-handed system. And therefore, resolving it, I need the cos of the angle, and that's just L. Hooray. Okay, so this direction cosines business really helps us. Then I need, uh, I've got a force opposing it of sigma 1, 1. And that's acting on an area KOL, so that's AL. But it already is in the one direction. Great. I've got also a sigma 2, 1 notice. 
and that's acting the other way, and that's acting on an area of AM. And I've also got a, a somewhere here a sigma 3 1. And that's acting on an area there of a n. Uh, and those must be in equilibrium, so they balance to zero. So what I've got here is I've got a sigma minus sigma 1, 1, l, once so I divide through by a, minus sigma 2, 1, m, minus sigma 3, 1, n equals zero. Um, now, if I go and do that for the other two axes as well, I'll get a similar set of equations, right? And what I'll get is I'll get uh, a minus sigma 1, 2, L. That's the one that related to. So this is this in the two directions. So the two direction is, is that one. And I've got a sigma 1, 2, L. So that's, uh, what am I looking for? I'm looking for that guy. And that's acting on the area A, L. So I've got... Once I cancel the A's, the A will go, so I'll just have a sigma 1, 2, L. Um, plus, I'll have a sigma minus sigma 2, 2, M. And then I'll have a minus sigma uh, 3, 2, N. And my third equation will be uh, minus sigma 1, 3, L, uh, minus sigma uh, 2, 3, M. Uh, plus sigma minus sigma 3, 3, n. And I've got three similar to equations. So sorry, that's the two axis, that's the three axis. If I take these three simultaneous equations, I can write them down um, as a matrix. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, also impose the requirement that sigma 2, 1 and sigma 1, 2 are the same. And I'm also going to uh, multiply through by minus 1. And then I'll get a, a, a tensor equation, um, or, um, which is going to be something like this. It's going to be sigma 1, 1 minus sigma. That's the multiplying through by minus 1, minus, uh, plus oops, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 2 minus sigma, sigma 2, 3, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3, sigma 3, 3 minus sigma times L M N is equal to zero. And uh, so I've just multiplied through by minus one to get that, impose the requirement. And that is an eigenvalue equation. This is uh, sigma ij minus uh, sigma times i times x is equal to naught. And the only non trivial solution to that is when the determinant of sigma ij minus sigma times i, uh, where well i is the identity matrix, um, is zero. And that's exactly what we had before. So what we can do is we can then uh, multiply that out and find out what the solutions must be. And what we get when we do that is the following rather unpleasant equation. Um, and I'm just going to give it to you because uh, it's a long, lo lots of lines to multiply it all out. How do you lose minus signs? So it's easy just to write down the answer. When you multiply it all out, what you get is, uh, and multiply through by minus 1, what you get is a sigma cubed minus sigma squared times sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 plus sigma times sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, plus sigma 2, 2, sigma, th yep. sigma 3, 3, uh, plus sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 1. Um, notice uh, all of the terms end up as cubes in stress, in so the dimensions at mega Pascal's cube. So if I've got a sigma cube there, I've got a sigma squared, and then I've got all terms of sigma, I've got a sigma, all terms of sigma squared. And uh, carrying this on, I also have uh, the shears all squared. Uh, what am I missing? 1, 3 squared. And then I have the unit term, and that is uh, minus sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, 
and the other ways I can get cubes. So I've got um, uh, twice sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 3, sigma 1, 3. And I also end up with a sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 3 squared, sigma 2, 2, sigma 1, 3 squared, and sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2 squared. But um, all equal to, I don't know if I run out of space, I'm going to put my 0 over here, 0. So that's what I get when I multiply out the eigenvalue equation here. And that has three roots, because it's a cubic for sigma. And those are the three principal stresses. Those are the three solutions where there's no shears on this inclined plane, which was the condition I originally put on it. Um, and the th those three principal stresses are determined by these three coefficients. This one, this one here, and this one here. So these three coefficients, i1, i2, and i3, are something fundamental about the system that determines what the um, principal stresses are. And so they are, um, because they're properties of the stress state, they're invariant to rotation. It doesn't matter what the axes are. So these are invariants, so-called. These are called stress invariants. Um, and uh, they're given in the notes. But the thing to notif notice is that this one, this one I1, is equal to the trace of the matrix. This is probably the most interesting one. Is equal to the trace of sigma and is invariant to rotation. Um, and that's equal to 3 times the hydrostatic stress. The hydrostatic stress is defined as the average of the components along the leading diagonal for the original stress matrix. Um, and that's, if you like, the average pressure. Uh, so if you're under the earth, go back to lecture one, if you're sorry, under the sea, um, then you'll have fluid around you on all sides. Uh, the pressure, the stress on all of the terms of the leading diagonal will be the same. Uh, and the average of those is, is the pressure. Um, it means the pressure that's acting everywhere. Um, so the other thing to notice, the trace is also equal to the sum of the three solutions for sigma. So the three eigenvalues, or the three principal stresses. So one check you can always have when you're finding principal stresses and finding eigenvalues is that the trace of the matrix has stayed the same, because it must be an invariant. Um, so there are a couple of um, properties that we can come up with when we're finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So um, for a stress matrix, uh, sorry, for a stress tensor, then if it's a square symmetric tensor, then the following things must always be true. Yeah? The trace of sigma stays the same. And if it's a real symmetric stress tensor, it's also true that the eigenvectors that is, the principal axes, are orthogonal. Oops. And usually we say that we'd rather they were unit eigenvectors just for convenience, at which point we would call them orthonormal. And that's, that's quite interesting. Now, if I've got three orthonormal vectors, um, then let's think about what, what that means. Um, so my principal stresses are at 90 degrees to each other. That's my new coordinate system that I can find is uh, a right-handed regular coordinate system that's at 90 degrees to each other. Now, if I've got three vectors that are at right angles to each other, so I've got, um, if you like, a, an x prime uh, which is equal to x1, x2, x3 in the original axes. Um, 
and I've got a, a, a if you like, so that's we'll call that x1 prime, um, and we'll give that uh, then components x1, 1, x1, 2, and x1, 3, and the same for x2 and x3. If this is no a normal vector, uh, sorry, a unit vector, then if I know x1 and x2, I'm, I've determined x3, so these two are independent. Now, for x2 prime, which is also a unit vector, sorry, then, um, so that's determined. So this one is, those two are both things we need to find out. So this is x2, 1, x2, 2, and x2, 3 in the original set of basis vectors. Now, this is determined by it being a unit vector because the sum of the squares of the components has to be 1. That is the direction cosines. Now, the other thing is here, in order for it to be at 90 degrees, that is, it's perpendicular to x1, the dot product of them is 0, that also knocks off this guy. So I've only got one independent variable left now. Now the other thing is that if I take uh, the cross product of those two, then I determine x3 hat, which is x3, 1, x3, 2, x3, 3, and those are completely determined by it being at right angles to the other two and being a unit vector. So um, I've only got three independent variables. In determining a new basis vector set, a new set of orthogonal unit vectors for my new axis system. Um, and those can be components, um, and often it's easier to work with components, uh, but they could also be rotations, and that we'll look at next uh, in the next little part. But first what we want to do is turn this into a general rotation, so rather than being principal stresses, just stresses for a general rotation. And that's what we're going to do just in a moment, but I, I first I need to do some rubbing off. Now, if I do a stress rotation in 3D for my first vector, um, I have a, a bit to do here, a bit more, because on this cut plane, I will also have some shears in the general case. That is, uh, if I call this normal stress sigma primed in its 1, 1 direction, this is the first vector of the three for my new orthogonal basis set. I'll also have some shears on that plane. Let's call them uh, sigma 1, 2 prime and uh, sigma 1, 3 prime. Um, now, then, in order to find out what the stress state is, so this is now... Um, a slightly different notation. X1 is it x1, comma 1, x1, comma 2, x1, comma 3. Um, so that's the definition of this. So it's still direction cosines, but this is now uh, uh, a vector like this and we're writing it that way for reasons that become obvious. It's the first of the three possible uh, normal vectors. And actually, instead of calling it x, I'm now going to call it a. Just because that reflects the tensor notation. And that's what we're moving towards. So, uh, we've got our, our inclined plane, it's essentially the same, um, but now we need to say that this here, instead of being AN, it's AX11. This is A, uh, sorry, that's AX11. L, this is the second axis, so that's X12. 
This is the third axis, so that's x, 1, 3. Uh, not x, a. There we go. Right. So now it's just like the one before, except we now need to... Uh, so we're now going to resolve forces in three perpendicular directions. Um, and I'm going to choose to do it normal to the plane this time, actually. So now I'm going to say that... Uh, and I can also do it for the other two. And now I'm going to find that sigma primed KL, if I make these IJKs instead of one, two, threes, this is then what I will find is that the gap gives me sigma K1. So K is the new basis vector. And L is the uh, old basis vector, if you like. So that's equal to sigma k1. Times a k1, a l1. So if you like, if this was sigma uh, primed one one, it would be sigma one one a. Uh, 1 1 L 1 1 yeah so uh, sorry a 1 1 a 1 1 so it would be sigma 1 1 a 1 1 squared yeah which is the first of my direction cosines squared um, plus uh, Sigma one two times a k one a oops k one a l two plus a k two a l one and this is really difficult to distinguish your l's and your ones um, plus sigma one three and I'm going to end up with two of those right so because I've got two of these here. Um, and that gives me a k1 a l3 plus a k3 a l1 uh, plus sigma 2 2 um, so this must be a 1 1 sigma 2 2 um, yeah sigma 2 2 a k 2 a L two plus sigma two three A K two A L three plus A K three A L two and then we've got a final term um, which is going to be sigma three three A K three A L three all very tedious. Um and uh, you do that by resolving in, in normal two and in the three directions in the way that we've always done before in 2D. It's just a lot more tedious to do in 3D. And what this is, is sigma prime is equal to A sigma A transpose. Um, that's the same thing as doing a tensor rotation where A is equal to a matrix where you put the three new basis vectors in as the rows. Um, so that is, the new basis vector is the first digit index and the old basis vector is the second index. Um, so this rotation matrix here, tensor rotation matrix, has the property that its inverse is equal to its transverse, uh, transpose, because it's an orthonormal matrix. Um, or an ortho um, and Therefore, uh, if you imagine these were principal stresses, for instance, sigma prime, if we multiply on the right by A, um, is equal to A sigma. And this uh, then get, gets you a, a general rotation. So it's as if you were doing an eigenvalue to the principal stresses and then an eigenvalue back, if you like. Um, it depends if it's helpful. But that's how you do a general uh, 
uh, tensor rotation. So if you like writing it in suffix notation, then in suffix notation it would be sigma KL is equal to AKI uh, sigma LJ, uh, sorry, A A L J sigma I J. So uh, K and L are the two that aren't repeated, um, and I and J are the two that are and disappear in suffix notation. And if you sit and stare at that for a little while, you will come to the conclusion that they are the same thing. And if you sit and stare at those two for a little while, you'll come and realize that they are the same thing. So what this is, is a tensor rotation. Um, so this is how we rotate stresses in, in general. It's a tensor rotation. Um, and uh, in the general case, it's quite ugly. Um, and, but that's what you can do. So let, let's just sort of move on and do an example. Um, so let's do an e just give that a quick test drive and see how it works. So I'm on the example 3.7 on page 17. So I've got a single crystal which is loaded with the following stress matrix referred to its 100 type axes. So it's the 510101015 tensor, if you like, multiplied by 20 MPA. That's referred to its 100 type axes. And the question is, what are the stresses on its uh, 111, 11 bar 0, and 11 bar 2 axes? So what we need to do first is we need to form our uh, tensor rotation matrix, A. So A is going to be uh, 1 over root 3 of 1, 1, 1. So that's 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. It's the first row because we need to make them normal uh, unit vectors. Then we've got 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2. Oops, 0 for the second one. And this has a length 6, so this is 1 over root 6, um, 1 over root 6, and minus 2 over root 6. And notice these are genuinely normal to each other. Um, and uh, I've also made sure they're a right-handed set, actually, um, in terms because otherwise I'd have to flip two of them around. Um, and... That's my, so that's my A. So now I just have to form uh, A sigma A transpose. So sigma prime is going to be, that's A. Now I've got my sigma. Well, that's easy. And now I've got to make that the transpose of that. And the transpose is that of that's quite easy as well. I just have to flip the columns around. So I've got 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, uh, 1 over root 2, minus 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 6, 1 over root 6, minus 2 over root 6. OK. So now uh, I can perform the matrix multiplication any way, which way around I like. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do those two um, first, but I could do it however I wanted. Um, so if I take that row times that column, I'm going to take the 20 out as a factor. Um, and if I do that row times that column, I'm going to get 5 plus 1 root 3s. So I've got 6 over root 3. That row times the second column is going to give me 2 over root 3. That row times the third column is going to give me 6 over root 3. And then that row times the first column will give me 5 minus 1, 4 over root 2s. Um, 
and then I get 1 over root 2, and minus 1 over root 2. That 1 times that column gives me 5 plus 1, 6 over root 6, minus 1 over root 6, minus 9 over root 6. So I've got that row times that column, so I've got uh, one of them there and a minus 10 of them there, so that gives me minus 9 in total. Multiplied by this, uh, so I've just got to write that out. Excuse me while I just do the accounting. Should be a 6. Okay, now I've got to do the second matrix multiplication. Um, so I go that times that. Um, I'm still going to get my root 3s are going to square up, um, but I'm going to leave them there actually. Uh, well, am I? No, I'm not. Um, so if I do 20 times, multiply those two together, I've got 6 plus 2 plus 6, that's 14 divided by 3 squared. So that's 14 uh, root 3 squared over 3. Um, do that times that one. I've got 6 minus 2. So that's uh, 4 over root 6. That one times that one. I'm going to be over root 18. How ugly. Uh, I've got 6 plus 2 is 8. Minus 12 so is minus 4 over root 18, and then I keep on going, and I get the following. And if I multiply that out, I get a set of numbers. Now, what are the things to notice here? Well, this is still a symmetric matrix, that is, it's still a stress matrix. Um, when I add up the values along the leading diagonal, actually they are uh, 200, which is what I started with. Um, MPA, need to put the unit on. Um, and because the trace is invariant, um, and uh, that's, that's it, essentially. So if I want to know what the stress is on the 110110 plane, because I'm interested in the shear stress uh, on that dislocation, then that's that number, yeah, times 20, which is uh, 32.7 MPA on the 111110 uh, uh, plane in the 111 direction. So that's the stress on shear stress on that dislocation. So if you want to find the shear stress on all 12 dislocations um, for, uh, say it was FCC, um, then you have to go and do this 12 times, um, which uh, sounds dull. Um, but uh, you can do it. We have computers. Therefore, uh, you can write a computer program to do it. And then it's not enormously hard, right? You just Get a, get a program to do the maths for you. You can do it in MATLAB, you can do it in Python. Um, it's all very nice. Um, they all have the tensor rotations built in as library functions, so you just call them. It's not very hard. Um, and uh, so that generally gives us a, um, a methodology for doing it. Now, um, that's uh, a very nice. Um, and so we can generally do stress rotations uh, in the general case. Um, onto a set of axes. We just need to remember that they need to be uh, orthonormal axes. They form a right-handed set, they're orthogonal to each other, and they ha are unit vectors. Um, and that's how we do uh, stress rotations. Now there's uh, two other comments I want to make uh, about uh, both rotations and Moore's circle. So um, I'm going to Just rub this off. So we said that um,
So we said that our general rotation we could describe by uh, a rotation tensor. So if we had a rotation tensor of the following form, then we'd have a rotation um, of psi about the z-axis. So this is a rotation of psi about z. Yeah, and that would give me uh, a new, that would rotate me from a, a say from a, a frame x, y, z to a new frame. We'd only be changing x and y, x prime, y prime, z. Okay, then we could do another rotation um, and we'd need to pick another axis to rotate around uh, and we want to change z. Um, so uh, if we did that again, um, then we could rotate for an angle theta about x, say. So if we do another rotation by theta oops, about x, we multiply this by another a, um, so that would be a rotation of about x, so these wouldn't change. We'd be doing a Moore's circle, if you like, around x by an angle of theta, cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. And that would then rotate me, x prime would stay the same, but we'd then be in a second frame, y double prime, and I'm going to go for this is after the second rotation, so I'm going to call it z double prime. And then um, we said we needed three numbers to define an ortho orthogonal basis vector set. So we're going to need to do three rotations in total. Um, so uh, we do another rotation, um, and we can either call that psi 2 or we can call it um, phi. I'm going to call it phi. And we'll do that again about the z-axis, but it's about the new z-axis. So then we do that again, um, and this is, this is going to be cos phi sine phi minus sine phi cos phi about 0, 0, 1. And what we're doing then is we're doing three rotations in turn. So we'd have, um, if you like, uh, move this over a bit. If we call this A1, A2, and then my third rotation, A3, I'd have started off with sigma and I'd have done A1. Then I would do A2. Then I would do A3. So I would end up with uh, a rotation matrix that was those three in turn. So if I multiplied a3 by A2 by A1, I would have a general rotation matrix uh, with uh, a, set of, a set of components describing the new axes corresponding to those three new rotations. Um, and that would be the new transformation matrix, um, which is really very cool. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of describing a rotation in the general sense. There's your three uh, orthonormal vectors, but they only have three independent components. We have our three what are called Euler angles that we've just defined here, which are psi, theta, phi. Um, or we can have an axis that, we, that um, we're rotating around that's a, a common axis between the two. That's called an axis angle pair. The axis is a unit axis, so it only has two independent components and it has an angle. Um, and there's also a, another method called a Quaternion's method. So uh, this is favoured by transmission electron microscopy types. This is favoured by um, uh, mathematical crystallography types. Uh, this is easiest to do in computing. Um, so it depends what, what you're trying to do. Um, but that's generally how we how we 
deal with this is there's three angles. Now, it might be uh, strange. Uh, you might be wondering, well, I thought I only needed two angles to describe where I was in 3D space. But why do I need three to define an orientation? And there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, one that's quite commonly used is that if you've got uh, a boat on the surface of the Earth, um, then here's you in your boat on the surface of the sea. There's, there's your mast, there's your flag here. You need to know where you are and where you're going. That is your orientation. You need to know both uh, your angle down from the North Pole, your angle around the Greenwich Meridian, and also which way it is that you're pointing. So you need three angles to describe an orientation. If you're a boat on the surface of the Earth, it's not much use knowing where you are if you don't know where you're pointing, because you don't know where to point, where, to, where you're going then. Um, another way to think about it is that if I take a, uh, a little cube, so here's a little cube, if I think of a crystal structure, if it's pointing on a regular sort of set of axes, I can d work out where this, this normal face is pointing. So I'm going to put that in as my, as my bolt here. I can go down and around. So that defines where that face is pointing. But I don't necessarily know where these faces are pointing yet because I've got a free rotation. So to know the orientation of a crystal, I really need a third angle to describe which way it's pointing. So I do need three angles to describe the orientation of a 3D object that has faces, like my crystal structure. Um, so I do need three angles to describe an orientation. Um, and those are the three independent components in my orthonormal vectors, or my three Euler angles, uh, or the three components of my independent components of my axis angle pair. So the last thing to say is about Moore's circles. Imagine I have rotated to and successfully found my principal axes and my principal stresses, and we'll call them sigma 1, 2, and 3. And um, conventionally, this is one of those little things that's a bit not right. You put them down in descending order. Um, there's actually a problem with that, which is that you haven't necessarily put them in a right-handed or um, basis vector set. So actually, it's not necessarily quite the right thing to do. But nevertheless, that's the convention. The only thing is to remember, you might have a problem that your basis vector set isn't right-handed. Um, you can easily fix that, actually, by flipping the third uh, principal axis the other way so that it is a right-handed basis vector set, and then you can make this the right thing to do. OK, so it's, it can be OK, right? It's, it's sort of fine. But you just need to check that your um, principal axis set is genuinely right-handed. That is, that x1 cross x2 is equal to x3. Um, not minus x3. Um, it's a little trap for the unwary. But anyway, say you have found your principal axes. Now, you can do a Mer circle between sigma 1 and sigma 2. That's the purple one. You can also do a Mer circle between sigma 2 and sigma 3. That's the blue one. 
Or you could do an immersed circle around sigma 1 and sigma 3. That's the outer one. So the outer one is doing a rotation about the second axis. That the, so the sigma 1 and sigma 3 immersed circle is a rotation about this axis 2. And the sigma 1 and sigma 2 one is a rotation about axis 3. And the sigma uh, 2, sigma 3 Mohr's circle is a rotation about axis 1. OK. Now, what's the biggest shear stress you can find? Well, it's the one here. It's the uh, difference between sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 is the maximum shear stress you can find anywhere in the stress system, however you rotate it. It's, at 45, it's a 45 degree rotation about axis 2 uh, bet between uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3. Okay, so that's, that's very interesting. We'll come back to that when we think about yielding, actually. Um, and, uh, but the other thing to notice is that we can do any rotation by doing a rotation about this one and getting say a stress state there and sigma 3. That would be what if we rotated about uh, the third axis first. Then we could do a rotation about um, the, uh, so that would be a rotation, so green is a rotation about the third axis and that gives me these points in X. We could then do a rotation uh, about this axis, so the blue one is the blue one is uh, the rotation about axis uh, one prime. So this gives me two axes, one prime, two primed, and my original three. So I do a rotation about one primed, uh, and that's involving. So this is going to be sigma one prime comma tor prime, and this will be sigma two prime comma tor prime. And this will be sigma 3, comma 0. Those would be my components of my new stress matrix. If I then did a rotation about 1 prime, I'd be doing a rotation between these two and a Mohr circle there. Um, and that I could then go and find an, another stress state there. That would give me sigma 3 after the second rotation, sigma 3 double prime, comma tor second. And this would be giving me sigma 2 double primed, comma tor double primed after a rotation. Uh, there. Um, I need to get this right. So I need to do. Sorry, I need to do go there. So because the center's still, yeah, center's still there. So it would actually be there. And I'll call those the dots now. So that's sigma th two double prime comma tall double primed. So that's the circles, the dots. And that's my um, one primed, uh, two double prime, three double primed set of axes. And I can then do a rotation, say, uh, about the three double primed axis again, involving the third component and get a third rotation. So I can do an arbitrary rotation by doing three rotations about three axes in by doing more circles. And it's just the same as we were talking about a moment ago about doing tensor rotations. It's just a bit more. I don't know, it's either more or less work depending on if you like Mohr's circle or not. Um, now, the other thing where this is useful um, are going the other way around. If you want to find principal axes, then if you start off with a stress matrix with some components. as normal, if I do a rotation about the 3 axis, then I would be doing a Mohr's circle involving, um, uh, say it's positive for the shear stress, involving sigma 1, 1, comma, sigma 1, 2, and sigma 2, 2, comma, sigma 1, 2. And I'd find some principal stresses there. And they would be, um, and so I would rotate about three to find the principal stresses. And I'd have left the three components alone.
but I get some principal stresses here, so I get a zero for the shears, and I'd find these two numbers. Uh, let's call them, um, I don't know, uh, sigma 1, 1 after the first rotation, sigma 2, 2 after the first rotation. Okay. Now, if I do a rotation about uh, the one primed axis, so about here, what I'll do is I'll do another Mohr circle involving this matrix. So I'll have a Mohr circle of uh, sigma 2, 2 primed sigma 2, 3, my original sigma 2, 3, that is, and sigma 3, 3, pro uh, which isn't primed, sigma 2, 3. And I do a Mohr circle with those, and I'd find another pair of principal stresses. Let's call them uh, sigma 2, 2 after the second rotation and sigma 3, 3 after the second rotation. So these terms would stay the same, dot sigma 1, 3, dot sigma 1, 3. But I'd have zeroed these out, and I'd have my sigma 2, 2, sorry, that's after the first rotation, after the second rotation, sigma 3, 3 after the second rotation. Now, if I did a rotation about the second primed axis, double primed axis, I would have a Mohr circle involving the things not, not there, so I'd have a Mohr circle between sigma 1, 1 prime, sigma 1, 3, and sigma 3, 3, double prime, sigma 1, 3. Uh, and I'd find a set of numbers, sigma 1, 1 triple primed, and sigma 3, 3 triple primed. And what I would have done is I'd have got rid of those, so I'd then have a stress matrix which was sigma uh, 1, 1 triple primed, sigma 2, 2 double primed, sigma 3, 3 triple primed. And I'd have got rid of all the other numbers. So you can do, uh, find the principal stresses by doing three Mohr circles in turn. So that's a, an alternative way to doing a rot tensor rotation to finding uh, the principal stresses. Um, or to finding the it's an alternative to finding the eigenvalues to find the principal stresses. So if you want to find the eigenvalues, that's fine. If you want to do three Mohr circles, that's also fine. You won't find um, uh, the uh, eigenvectors doing it that way. You won't find the principal axes, if you like, doing it that way. You'll find these three rotation angles, um, but it's a rotation about not quite the Euler angles, actually, so it's quite not quite right for the Euler angle uh, definition. It's another set of three angles that are independent that you can uh, use to define uh, a new basis vector set, if you like. Um, so uh, you can do it either way. Um, my observation would be when in doing problems is that people tend not to get this right, actually. They're better off finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors because there are some natural checks built in by um, them being right-handed orthonormal vectors um, and by the trace having to be preserved. That means that you can actually check your arithmetic and check all your minus ones to get it right. So although it seems like a bear, um, actually, in general, I think people do better trying to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors than they do doing it this way. But whichever you prefer, um, this is also a valid method, uh, and it works. Um, so uh, in this segment, we've done 3D rotations of stress matrices, both to find the principal stresses and in the general case. And we've talked about new basis vector sets. And that's going to be a very powerful tool for us to explore yielding uh, and e elasticity and anisotropic elasticity in the upcoming lectures. So I'll see you for those.